Greetings. This is Doc Ock coming to you live and direct today from Black Facts Headquarters Central. Another day, another story. And today, we're gonna, uh, we got a nice one for you today. Something interesting that I'm sure you may not have been aware of, but you will soon be. Meanwhile, let's go ahead and do our proverb of the day and our poem. Proverb for today is, there is no medicine against old age. There is no medicine against old age. And that is a proverb from Niger. Poem today. I picked a different poem. I didn't pick a Redmond poem today like I should have. But I got a good one for you. This is one I just wrote. And it's entitled Absolutely Drug Free. And it has to do with our story today. And I won't tell you how right now, but I will after I finish reading the poem. So let's see. I'm going to go ahead and do the needful, not the pleadful, and put on these glasses. Right. Cheer. There we go. All right. Absolutely drug free. You say that I should be absolutely drug free. Well, I am, ma'am. I don't take any drugs that they don't sell on TV. Well, I do take Tylenol, aspirin, warfarin, Ritalin, Prozac. Even though that shit is truly whack. If you really cared, you'd ban them from TV and save poor me. But you'd rather make money. Sometimes I get so nervous that I just can't sleep. And if this shit persists, I call my pharmacist on the quickness. If I can't eat and start to lose weight or go into an unconscious state, and this shit persists, I call my pharmacist on the quickness. When my head keeps pounding and I feel like I want to hurl, and this shit persists, I call my pharmacist on the quickness. And if any of this shit per persists, I call my pharmacist on the quickness and get me some more drugs. Absolutely drug free for all of you drug for drug free folks out there. Just a little something to think about. So, story of Dr. Crosby. Still telling the story of Dr. Crosby, and it is a uh, story that needs to be told. And right here, I've got a uh, photo from his days in the U.S. Army. And um, when Dr. Dorsey, I was watching the video last night, one of the videos that Dr. Dorsey did of uh, an interview with Dr. Crosby, an extended interview. And he talked about his time in the Army. And the first thing Dr. Dorsey asked him was, well, were the black um, servicemen, were they in a separate unit? Now, mind you, they were in England. But he wanted to know specifically, were they in a separate unit? Did they have separate barracks? And his answer was decidedly no. Now, he answered the question based on the fact that um, I think Eisenhower, Truman, one of those presidents had uh, integrated the U.S. Army some years ago, a few years before he entered the Army. However, it may have had more to do with the fact that he was not on U.S. soil, because if he'd been stationed in a southern camp, could have been different, possibly. But right here we have him at Fort Belvoir in Virginia, eastern Virginia. And clearly, you can see this is um, a group of soldiers all mixed up together in the same barracks. And there's Dr. Crosby front and center. 
right where he likes to be. So, enough said. Now, um, but in terms of getting into the army, he didn't exactly volunteer to go in to the army. As a matter of fact, he was drafted into the army. But before he was drafted into the army, he tried a number of subterfuges to get out of going into the army, beginning with um, claiming that he was a junkie. And that's why we read the poem, Absolutely Drug Free, because he did try to pretend to be a junkie. And that ended up getting him his first FBI file because the FBI had something to say to him about him claiming that he was a junkie. They wanted uh, to know, was he really a junkie or was he just trying to avoid going into the army? And he was just trying to avoid going into the army, but he couldn't admit that to the FBI. So he told them, no, he was really, he really was a junkie. But that still didn't get him out of going, out of being drafted. That didn't get him out of being drafted. And um, he already had his draft card. So he was all lined up to go into the Army. But what he decided to do was to, he, he ended up um, going with a friend of his to, um, oh, and here it is right here. This is the part I'm looking for. Right here. Yeah, right here. Here we go here. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to start here with um, something else that you don't know about Dr. Crosby and that I myself had never heard of until I was listening to the tape um, that he did with Dr. Dorsey. And now I realize I can also reference it from his unpublished autobiography. So we'll start right here. After, uh, after he left St. Edwards and enrolled at Alexander Hamilton Junior High, he happened to choose from the boys that he met the more rowdy types, unlike a friend of his named John Christopher, who he had met at St. Edwards and who had lived in uh, Mount Pleasant all his life. He, I didn't refuse to run with the down-to-earth crowd I had just met. As I insinuated earlier, when I said my brothers, sister, and I were used to playing on dirt before we moved to Mount Pleasant, I was trying to suggest we had been living in what is still commonly referred to as a ghetto or a slum by everyone but those who lived there. When we moved to Mount Pleasant, even its name suggested we had moved on up to a better life. Moving on up also meant we would now have more white people living in close proximity to us. We would see white young people in school. We would see white people in the stores. Um, where were we at? On the, on the streets, in the library, in the banks. Soon, however, we began to see fewer and fewer white people on the streets and in school. Oh, yes. We would continue to see them in the neighborhoods, business establishments, but this time they would be the owners. And on occasion, the owner's children who no longer lived in the community. They just went to school there until graduation. On other occasions, we would hear, hear our parents or other older people in general talking about how white people were fleeing our community. We also started hearing how this was also happening in other neighborhoods on the east side of Cleveland. It was also interesting, as it happened, that many of these communities, or better put, neighborhoods, into which African Americans were moving, many of them had been formerly Jewish. I became, at the time, somewhat interested in these people and whites of other religious or national extractions running from our presence as neighbors, but returned to get the earnings, their products usually third rate, gained in their business establishments, such as the gains from their banks, drugstores, groceries, and of course, the ever 
present pawn shops. As our neighborhood experienced white and Jewish flight, black people talked about the phenomenon more and more. So much more, the gang of young men I had taken up with began to exhibit resentful attitudes towards white people in general, and we would engage in unlawful acts against them with the least provocation. Initially, my gang, the Satans, would single out white John Adams High School students to pick fights with and have four or five like-thinking others join in. We would attack white people, young or old, at night as they were getting off the Kinsman Road streetcars at 130th to catch a crosstown east 130th street bus. We would not only attack white people on dark streets, we would attack their businesses, particularly their storefront windows. A special attention was given to wine store windows. On occasion, breaking their windows or entering their businesses, we would take out bottles of wine. And as if that wasn't enough, I ended up committing violence against myself. Hmm. Now that's kind of odd. I don't remember now what happened to the others after drinking wine. However, I do remember a good friend of mine and former East fellow East Tech student, Fred Taylor, who found me drunk lying in a field and carried me home where my mother tried to sober me up by placing ice cubes in my armpits, all the while wishing I'd come to before my father returned home. Imagine that. She was hiding my drunkenness from my father. When I came to, after the ice cube attack on my armpits and later sleeping off the wine, I swore off drinking wine in general. Much later in life, I became a teetotaler when I recognized while lecturing that I had begun to slur my words. Even after I had given up drinking, it was time to quit that shit. My gang, the Satans, and I became unwelcome in the neighborhood. And some, including myself, were denied access to dances and parties. The Satans were declared hoodlums, persona non grata. In English, we were unwanted, and when caught, some people in the neighborhood wished we would just call the police. And when caught, some people in the neighborhood wished we would just call the police, hoping we'd be locked up forever. Hmm. I think that's someone would just call the police, wished someone. All right. That never happened. Here I was now defacing property and engaging in violence toward unsuspecting and innocent people and never once was I or any of my buddies confronted by the police. Hmm. I was going downhill even faster than before. My performance in school was getting worse. I was always in the assistant principal's office. Mr. Lott had made it, I thought, a habit of calling my mother to a conference. On one occasion, when he thought he was using words my mother would not know or understand, he purposely pronounced students of his ilk. Always, uh, this is a quote, students of his ilk seemed always to find a quality high school like John Adams difficult, end quote. John Adams was open in 1926 or thereabouts. Mr. Lott told my mother I was the worst student ever to have attended this quality high school since its opening. Now, mind you, if it opened in 1926, by the time he got there, it couldn't have been more than about 10 to 15 years old. So basically, this was a new school building. Okay. So worst student ever. My mother blew up. Quote, what do you mean, students of his ilk? She, rec end quote, she recognized he was alluding 
to the increasing influx of black students. I don't remember the exact words she used to put him in his place. However, whatever she said, Mr. Lott knew he had put his foot in his mouth and he melted. He excused himself, begging her pardon, hoping she would give him some slack. When we had left his office, my mother lit into me before we had gotten out of earshot of his office. She told me I had better learn to behave myself and let me know she was not through with me and would, quote unquote, talk to me. <laughs> as soon as I home from school, I knew exactly what kind of talking she was talking about. <laughs> okay. My attitudes towards school didn't change much, but I knew better than to display this attitude around my mother. Oh, yes, Mr. Lott didn't have to request my mother come to his office again. The treatment I received when I returned home, that talking to she gave me, was enough for me to avoid having to endure that pain ever again. No, she didn't beat me. I'd grown too large, but she did read the conditions I would have to follow to keep living at 3324 East 130th Street. Before long, I even dared to drop out of high school and started working for a short time with my father, picking up clearinghouse numbers from his players. That is, customers. I even enjoyed the negative honor of possessing a federal gambling license at the tender age of 16 or 17. That didn't last long because the police picked me up and ended my working with my father, picking up numbers. To find myself, I began building model airplanes and other objects, such as those that came with advanced erector and chemistry sets. I pursued the hobby of building model airplanes and rockets well into my 30s and 40s when I constructed... Okay, see, this is why I told him not to bring me up in the story because I'm editing this part right here on the fly. When I constructed a model with a six foot wingspan that was fitted with a gas engine and a radio control system in uh, conjunction with my son, Michael. That's right. Two of us worked on that together. Well, no, I put it together. Hmm. All that glue I sucked up, better get my credit. Several years later, okay, he leaves me out again. I sold it on eBay to a lady living in Japan. She bought it for $150 and asked me to ship it. Okay, no. They weren't in Japan. They were in Texas. Okay. Ooh-wee. Okay. Kind of makes you wonder sometimes. I keep from going under. <laughs> if it wasn't for the fact that we had that tape, where you talked about some of these things earlier, uh, I'd be suspect. But this part, I know he wrote this later because I remember when we sold it and I have a picture of us holding the airplane. Um, yeah, after I had, I had already sold it right before we shipped it out. Well, at any rate, our time is about up. So I'm going to end right there because that's at the end of a paragraph anyway. So I just would just end right in there and then we'll pick that up. and. We'll get to the part about him joining the service on the morrow. Okay. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. So I'll just leave that right here. But I do find some of these things to be quite interesting. Yeah. And like I said, that part about the model airplane, find that to be most interesting because it was a it was a large plane, a six foot wingspan, three foot fuselage. I don't remember how big the tail was, but we covered it. We used to cover it with uh, with um, tissue paper. And the early models we covered we covered with tissue paper, and then you would you would uh, soak it with dope. They called it dope. You'd soak it with this dope, and then you would paint it after you soaked it with the dope because the dope would make the tissue paper. It would go it infuse itself into the tissue paper and make the outside kind of stiff and hard, and then you could go ahead and paint it after you had infused it with the dope. But that dope, that's exactly why they call it dope. Yep, you guessed it, because it would make you feel like you were really dopey. It would get all up in your head and make your head light. So you had to have the window open. Thank you for letting me know that. 
you had to have the window open in order to let the air out. So that, or, you know, get some, some cross ventilation in there. So we built that plane in my bedroom on my desk. That I remember for sure. Maybe not all of it, but I know some parts of it were built there because we certainly weren't working on his desk because he had business to take care of on his desk. So it definitely didn't happen there. At any rate, enough of my editing of my father's autobiography. Meanwhile, my time is up. Our time together is up today. We'll be black here this evening at nine for further tales of Dr. Crosby, his loves, likes, reflections on life. Tonight we'll be reading a um, the, the another story. I haven't decided which one yet. We had been reading Schoenberg, but we're going to move on from Schoenberg to another story I have that talks about some of those people that Mr. Schoenberg, that was, that was mentioned in the book about Mr. Schoenberg, the man who made the library, whose library has become a New York City institution right in Harlem. Huge building. I don't have pictures of the modern building, but that modern building is much larger than the old one, though. All right. Meanwhile, uh, I'm out of here. Peace out, y'all.